Welcome to the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture online. I'm David DeCerto, Director of Programming here at the Sheen Center, the Performing Arts Center of the Archdiocese of New York. Uh, we ask that you please like us on Facebook, subscribe to our Sheen Center YouTube channel, and go ahead and click that bell icon for future notifications. This year marks the 700th anniversary of the death of Dante Alighieri, the great Italian poet whose three-part masterpiece, The Divine Comedy, or The Commedia, is arguably the greatest literary work ever written. It tells the journey of a soul through hell, purgatory, and heaven, accompanied by three guides, Virgil, Beatrice, and St. Bernard. Today, we're fortunate to have three guides of our own to help us on our way. Joining us from Rome is noted art historian, Dr. Elizabeth Lev. She's authored four books, including How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, and her newest, The Silent Night, a history of St. Joseph as depicted in art. She's a longtime friend of the Sheen Center, and I'm thrilled to have her back. Professor Randy Boyagata is an author, literary and cultural commentator, and a professor of English at the University of Toronto, where he serves as the Vice Dean Undergraduate of the Faculty of Arts and Science. He's also a returning friend of the Sheen Center, who spent time here at Sheen as an artist in residence while working on his recently published novel, Dante's Indiana. And last but certainly not least, Father Paul Pearson of the Toronto Oratory, whose three-volume Spiritual Companion Guide to the Divine Comedy, published by Tan Publishers, should be required reading for anyone seeking a deeper spiritual understanding of Dante's work. It's my pleasure to welcome our panelists. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Liz and Randy, welcome back. And Father Paul, it's, it's wonderful to finally meet you. Good to meet you too. Thank you. So, um, before I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball, but before we get to the questions, uh, since some of you are teachers, in fact, all of you are teachers, I'll take a raise of hand. Um, for those not familiar with uh, the author, Dante, could somebody give a very brief uh, little bit of background about the author um, and how he came to writing uh, this work? Who, who, who wants to volunteer? Uh, Okay. How about, like how, students, I can't do it. It makes me feel like my own students. I can't, the, the downward gaze, I can't, I can't do it. If my students catch me doing that, I'll never be able to hold my head up in the classroom again. I'll, I'll, I'll. There so, you go. <laughs> Dante was born in, um, in 1265. He's a, he's a Florentine. And he's a member of, uh, so 1265 is a really interesting period to be born. We're 40 years after the the death of St. Francis and, and the Franciscans and that spirituality is burgeoning all over the place together with that of the Dominicans. Uh, the universities have been open for about a thousand years and the possibilities of education are very strong and Florence has been self-governing for about 15, uh, 150 years. And so Dante is born into rather an upper level uh, family in, um, uh, in, in Florence and what was a sort of considerably smaller Florence than we see today. And um, he uh, was a, a, a scion of a family that belonged to a political party that was called the White Wells. And politics are kind of life's blood in, in Florence, and that will eventually be the undoing of, of Dante. Um, taking advantage of his status, he was able to get a, quite an education, probably starting in cathedral schools, but he eventually made his way, as far as we understand, to the University of Bologna that had rather large repercussions for me because I went there because he went there. Um, but the, um, the, the fact is that he was very drawn to poetry. And he became kind of like a pop star, uh, singing a lot about passions of you know women and 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 and, and, and politics and he had so involved in this sort of new what was called the sweet new style it was a kind of new catchy beautiful form of love poetry with a whole ethos behind it all the while still being involved with the political life in this city which was an essential part of being florentine and eventually the life of dante has a tremendous moment, one of the most common, the more important moments in the life of Dante starts when he's, when he's, when he's, a, when he's a young man 
and he encounters this, this woman named Beatrice or Beatrice on the street. I think it was nine years old at the time. And this this love at first sight will be sort of a, a, it will emerge in his life as something that will that will begin to guide his art and guide his steps. So we have all these different components of Dante's life. We have his his political career, we have his poetry career, and we have his love life. Now Dante will only meet Beatrice twice. He'll end up getting married to someone whose name we barely remember, and he'll have he'll have children, of course. But the the guiding love will be this unattainable woman who dies uh, unexpectedly uh, at a very young age. And uh, Dante will uh, seek solace in poetry and become something of a famous Latin poet. So, so writing and reading a lot of Latin poetry. In the meantime, his other job, his, his political job, eventually comes to a head due to intrigues and machinations between Pope Boniface VIII and the different political parties in Florence. And the other major event of his life is when he is exiled from Florence. And so he will spend the rest of his life traveling around from place to place to place, looking for shelter as he writes this great epic poem of the Divine Comedy. And so his, his life is spent, the end of his life is spent in exile, as we know, he died in 1321 and was it September 20 was the day and so this is the but as he writes this poem as he tries to as he tries to find his way spiritually as well as finding his way materially the great guide that will lead him to this new kind of poetry this poetry that will be written in Italian and not Latin will be uh, the woman Be Beatrice or Beatrice who uh, ultimately inspires him so I think Dante's life is extremely convoluted and complicated. I hope that was, uh, given the fact that you caught me uh, a little off guard, I hope that made some sense to the to the listeners. But at least I feel like we throwing all the cards in the air, something will land that will be something we can start with. Uh, if that's catching you off guard, I'd like to see how well you do when you are on guard. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we have this medieval poet. And in March of this year, Pope Francis wrote an apostolic letter commemorating the death of Dante in which he called him uh, a prophet of hope and a witness to the innate yearning for the infinite present in the human heart. Why after seven centuries are we still talking about this medieval poet? And why is the comedy still relevant to modern readers? I kind of just toss that out to all of you and maybe we'll give Dr. Lev a little bit of a break. Go to one of the gentlemen. After you, Father. Okay. okay. I think part of the reason is that we've reached a place in society where human beings have really given up on the possibility of happiness. We see our life disintegrating in front of us. We see society disintegrating in front of us. And as a result, we find the possibility of happiness harder and harder even to imagine. And I think what Dante does for us and is to provide a way out of that and to recognize that somehow our life is disordered precisely because we are disordered. And the beginning really of putting our lives back together is putting our souls back together. And Dante goes through this process himself. This is why I find the section of the comedy, the Purgatorio so important because there you really see that a good soul a soul who's just off track, but still pointed in the right direction, gradually getting rid of all the, the disorder and the, and, the, and the tensions and being able to direct himself in a way which allows him to be free. At the top of the mountain, Virgil says, I crown thee master of thyself. And this idea that human nature could still be mastered, that we could actually rediscover a happiness in the mess of this world is I think why the comedy is called a comedy in the first place, that there's a possibility of taking the mess that we live in and turning it into a blessed ending. And I think that's a hope that many people have lost track of. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, just in the title itself, comedy not suggesting what modern readers or audience members think of comedy, but comedy in the sense of the classical sense that it has a happy ending. Um, and I'm glad you brought up that topic of happiness. Um, you know, Randy, you, you're a, a, a teacher of literature and language. You work a lot with uh, students. Um, that whole idea of 
the reason why Dante wrote this work was uh, from a religious perspective to lead people to heaven, or at least to help them get there. But even if we broaden that out a little bit to that idea of that happiness is achievable. Um, there are many people who undoubtedly probably have it on their bucket list to read uh, the, uh, the, the three volumes of the Divine Comedy. But I'm sure there's a number of people in that camp who are a little bit intimidated by it, um, which is unfortunate because Dante did not want this just read by scholars and specialists. He really saw his, his character, um, his protagonist, I should say, um, as an everyman. So could you talk a little bit about um, what a reader who wants to start uh, opening this, this wonderful journey, but is a little bit hesitant or intimidated? Uh, could you give them a little words of encouragement? Absolutely. Um, well, let's begin, David, with what you were just saying a moment ago. It is notable that Dante made the decision to write in what we would now think of in some ways as the vernacular. He did not write uh, the Divine Comedy in Latin. He made the decision to write in, in Tuscan, what we now think of perhaps just more generally as Italian, and it was an invitation to, um, to a larger readership to join. So that's one important point. The second is the famous opening line of the poem, in the middle of the journey of our life. And it seems to me that the most important word in that opening is our. Dante invites you in to discern your own experience within the larger experience of the Divine Comedy. Um, you know, I think that so much of why we continue to read this poem today is that in many ways, uh, Dante was already there. In other words, I'm against a kind of progressive understanding of literary development. Dante's sense of some of the singularities of human experience of what it means to be lost, what it means to be found, what it means to seek the greater good, all of those are as relevant to anyone today as they were to anyone 700 years ago. And to find your way into the poem is in turn then to find that there is more to the poem than Inferno. And I'm very much building what, what Father Paul just said. Um, to the degree that Dante is known today, generally speaking, it would be for Inferno, I suspect. And that certainly is part of our kind of larger uh, public vocabulary, right? Dante, Dante has really given us our sense of hell. Uh, in general terms. But there's that's one third of the poem. There's so much more than only hell, and hell only matters for Dante as, as where he has to go, as he says in that opening canto, in order to show us the good that he saw elsewhere, the good that he knew that he was able to experience elsewhere, ultimately in paradise. And so this kind of universally available story uh, is one that I think anyone should sort of engage. I will say this about to your kind of immediate question. Don't worry about footnotes. Don't worry about historical context. Um, if you get the Dante bug, you will read this poem for the rest of your life. Then start looking at different editions. Then start looking at the footnotes. Then learn a little bit more about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, absolutely, and, and the Aeneid and so much else that's kind of going on in this poem. But to begin, just read the poem and um, find those moments of purchase and then go from there. That's wonderful. And I want to get back to that idea about the uh, sort of the modern focus on that first volume, The Inferno. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, Dr. Lev, in a recent article you wrote uh, that Dante believed in the power of beauty to save the world. Um, and you suggest that reading the Divine Comedy uh, as an invitation to bring beauty back into our daily discourse. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think one of the most important for, for me in this year of uh, the 700th anniversary, I think one of the reasons why we should be reconsidering or, or bringing Dante, holding him up again, is that uh, he created a language. He really took uh, all of this poetic language from a fragmented Italian peninsula. So the vernacular that we're talking about here is... Um, is a post-Latin Italian peninsula, where once there was one language uniting the entire peninsula during the period of the late Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. This is fractured by the fall of the empire and these separate pockets influenced by different invaders or events start creating separate dialectal languages, which makes it harder and harder and harder for people 
to understand each other because anybody who's been in Italy realizes that the dialect of Sicily is absolutely un, in, in, unintelligible to someone who is from Rome. So this, instead of having a separation of dialects that crystallize into a series of different languages, Dante uses his vast experience and incredible education and his, his innate talent to bring together this, these different words and phrases of all these different languages and to create a common language to bring people together. And what makes the language a language, not a dialect, is that he's able to describe beauty. He's able to create literature. He's able to create art out of language. And he's able to create art. I mean, in a certain sense, this is an amazing vanity piece on the part of an artist to be able to take us through the incredibly vivid descriptions of hell to the more metaphorical descriptions of purgatory to the point where he even describes that his own words fail him as he tries to help us visualize paradise. So I, I think what, what, I, what I mean by this beauty is also connected to the privilege of language. Dante really reminds us that our ability to communicate, our ability to have a language is a privilege. And it is something that should be used for good, something that should be used to draw people together instead of the way our modern era uses language all the time as a divisory, as a, as a divisory uh, 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 object or worse yet, as a kind of weapon. So that's, that's one of the things that really, that was one of the big points I was trying to make in these articles about Dante this year. Um. Randy, could we just build on that a little bit? As you know, as a teacher of literature and language, um, that whole idea of the power of language, um, and, and you know, uh, Liz was talking about how it, it unified, or at least was tried to start unifying a fractious Italy of its day. Um, can you talk about the importance of a piece of literature like uh, Divine Comedy? Uh, and, and how it speaks to our day where, uh, you know, words are increasingly uh, mean to, to sort of a borrow a phrase from Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland, uh, you know, what we say they mean. Well, I, I think what you're, what you're pointing to would be the, the different modes, I guess you could say, of reading the divine comedy. But we can think of it in terms of allegory. We can think of it in terms of uh, analogy. Um, there are the kind of underpinnings, right, that many ways we wouldn't have uh, the Divine Comedy were not for Virgil's Aeneid, for example. Um, and so you've got all these kind of multiple things happening at once. And I teach the Divine Comedy here at the University of Toronto every, every fall to a first year class on faith and ideas. And I teach usually a selection from, I usually teach like maybe the first five or six cantos of Inferno, and then the two postdoctoral fellows associated with this same class uh, will do the, will do likewise with Purgatory and uh, Paradiso. And what we are really trying to convey to students is that there are times when words mean one thing, um, and that's all. And then there are times where words can mean more than that. And the beauty of it is not to try to make the case myself, but to let Dante make the case. And so, for example, to listen, let's say, to Paolo and Francesca uh, explain how they ended up in an eternal whirlwind in hell is to know that they are telling the story of simply reading a book together. How could reading a book together um, end up in eternal punishment and being killed and then in eternal punishment? And so what I then do with my students is we, we look at the account that Paolo and Francesca offer in Canto Five of how they decided to read a book together once and what happened as a result. And in that case, David, um, the words mean more than they purport to mean. So in other words, we don't have to talk about, you know, the different structures and functions of language. We don't have to do that with, let's say, 18 year olds encountering the poem for the first time. But when someone's telling a story and you can tell it's a story of self justification, uh, there's something else going on with those words. There's something else, there's, there's other meanings there. And one of the, one of the, I think geniuses of Dante is how easy it is to identify with telling a story to mean one thing and revealing something else at the same time. And that's the beauty of engaging a work like this, that moment of discovery. Um, you know, you bring up uh, Dante's patron, uh, 
at Con Grande della Scala, and uh, that that famous letter where Dante is explaining to him the different modes in which we can mm. uh, read his work, uh, literal, allegorical, and so forth. Um, Father Paul, you have chosen uh, to view this in your three volume guides. You've chosen to view the poem through the eyes of spiritual direction, mm. um, sort of providing guidance for each reader to examine his or whole, his or her own soul on this journey. Uh, what's the most important thing for some that someone should keep in mind if they're coming to uh, this magnificent poem? Uh, with the hope of some sort of faith formation? Well, uh, there are many different ways to approach that. One of the things I think comes to mind primarily is that Dante isn't saved by an idea. The truth about hell and heaven are truths that he's known all along. He's a well-educated man and a well-formed man in his faith. But the thing that actually turned his life around was a particular intervention and in that he was actually surrounded by people who cared for him whether later in life that's Can Grande, or whether it's Beatrice and Lucy and the Blessed Virgin Mary interceding from heaven. This is a particular project, and Dante is treated as an individual who's cared for, and Providence has arranged things for him so that he gets put on the right path. This idea that somehow our lives are not just lost in this vast cosmos, and I'm an insignificant speck floating on the ectoplasm, but that somehow my life is the focus of all of this, and that heaven is conspiring for my salvation. That Dante is at the center of a drama, and that's part of the reason for that commedia thing again, is that everybody's life is a drama like that. In this world, we often feel so very lost, and the idea that somehow heaven would be interested in my salvation is almost unthinkable for most people. And so I think that this, I would start first of all with the idea that the heavenly host, God and the saints, the angels are taking my salvation far more seriously than I am and that they are constantly intervening. I might not notice that, but it's always happening. So that Dante is in fact not alone. He thinks he's alone at the beginning as Randy was talking about that wonderful first line. He thinks he's lost in a wood and he's by himself, but it turns out he's not by himself. The Blessed Virgin is, and has gotten Beatrice and, and Lucy together, and they've sent Virgil, and the forces of, of heaven are already beating down his door. And I think that idea that somehow heaven is at work for me, even before I know I need to be worked on, that's, I think, really important. Oh, that's wonderful, wonderfully said. Um, I sort of put this next question out to the three of you. Um, obviously, the central theme of uh, all three works is love. Uh, divine love, uh, the, the love that moves the stars, as that uh, beautiful last line says. Um, but it also makes distinctions within love. There's, there's rightly ordered love, there's wrongly ordered love, there's immoderate love, there's um, uh, too little love in some regards. Can you talk about what that central theme of love in all those variations has to say uh, to our day and our generation that is, you know, often raised on with the slogan that love is love. I uh, think that's one of the most interesting things about Dante in the present era, because the famous, 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 famous story of the uh, Paolo and Francesca is uh, ostensibly, well, what's wrong with love? And uh, mm -hmm. Dante, despite his own tremendous personal empathy, it is clear that there is something wrong with a love that that is is brought to act brings one to act sinfully and so it's a disordered love and he has a very clear idea of what it is and so i think what one of the really fascinating things by the way in in I, talking about the inferno question before um the inferno is um is the most illustrated in the history of art. Um, it is obviously very easy to illustrate because it's got, it's such a narrative uh, series of contos with such very specific and very vivid stories. But the absolute number one illustrated image of the entire divine comedy is Paolo and Francesco, which has been done hundreds of times. And what makes the, what's interesting is that in Dante's own period, but in the period of the Renaissance, let's say, immediately following Dante's death in, 12, in 1321, the illustrations of Paolo and Francesca make it very clear that Paolo and Francesca 
are figures that are, they're, they're sort of awkwardly naked figures who are in hell. But then when the, when the romantic movement gets a hold of Paolo and Francesca, it's almost impossible to imagine that they did something wrong. It's a very, the images are so sensual and so sympathetic. Instead of being buffeted together but never allowed to sort of gratify that touch, you see these figures where they're always kind of clothed, they're, they're, they cleave together, they move in this incredibly sensual fashion, showing that the sort of the, the romantics really uh, uh, tried to break apart the moralizing aspect of Dante's story and kind of painted as Dante could almost joining in his voice of this repressive church that doesn't let people love, but that's not at all what he's doing. His, his point is that as, as, as much as we may feel for them, nonetheless, as we listen to that story unfold, we realize that these are their actions that unfortunately captured before they could repent, bring them to this point. So it's a very, very interesting way that we perceive love today. And then, and then he continues to use the rest of the comedy to continue what is his catechesis on love. Hmm, well said. Could, could I build right on what Liz just said, actually, David? Please, absolutely. Um, just that that sense of, uh, I really like the way that you just put that, that this catechesis of love. Um, I see two notable examples of that as we kind of move towards um, Paradiso, as it were, and or Paul, Father Paul's comments. Um, hell is frozen at its core. Uh, I think that is one of maybe one of the more surprising features for someone who might not know the fullness even of Inferno, that Inferno at its core is cold, is ice cold, because to betray someone, to betray Christ, you have to be that cold. And that sense um, of, of love manifests in its opposite as a kind of a full coldness, I guess you could say, is what's striking as another form, that that is what betrayal is. That, that seems to me um, another lesson on the way to catech of, of catechesis. But for me, um, even more striking, even because that one you can get, get your head around. For me, what's even more striking is late in purgatory, when at last Dante encounters Beatrice at the end of the, the triumphant procession um, in, the, uh, in the Garden of Earthly Delight, the top of purgatory, as Father Paul was, was describing earlier. At last, right, this, this object and subject of his life and his life's work, they're back together at last. And, you know, cue heavy strings and Hollywood <laughs> rom-com reunion. And Beatrice takes him to task. She tears a strip off of him for how he has lived his life. And it develops in the context of that catechesis of love a fuller, more mature sense of what love itself is and ought to be. That it's not uh, merely romantic love, but rather um, is a love that cares about the ultimate good of the other person. And in that case, sometimes it means a difficult conversation. Um, and so, to, and for Dante to kind of situate that encounter that way, instead of in a, in a kind of a corrective of Apollo and Francesca or some further elaboration of the courtly tradition that he was sort of riffing on La Vita Nuova, an earlier work of his, to make it a, an act of, of upbraiding, sets the stage, I think, for what happens in Paradiso in terms of the interplay of Eros and Agape. Over to you, Father Paul. Well, I think that that, that final stage of purgatory when they're going through lust tells me a little bit about how Dante looks at love. He sees lust is not just something that needs to be eradicated. He actually sees it as something that requires retooling because that if the effective powers are not things to be rejected, they're, to, they're there to be purified and straightened out. They're an essential part of who we are. So Dante's there at the edge of the fire and he sees these souls right there in the midst of the flames and thinks, my goodness, I can only think of all the souls I've seen, all the bodies I've seen burning in the square in Florence. This is good, what's gonna to happen to me. But in fact, the flames, I think, mean something different. The flames there are the flames of love too. Dante steps into them and notices that the people there are not whipping themselves with, with cords or wearing hair shirts. They're in processions and every once in a while at the, a signal, everyone embraces and then they separate from one another. 
It's almost as though they're learning the right way of being affectionate again. They're sort of relearning giving themselves away to one another in a way which isn't selfish, selfish, but is in fact really grounded in one another's humanity. So we see here not a denial of our passions, but a perfecting of them and lifting them up to a new level. Let's move on to that idea that Father Paul, you brought up earlier. The idea, uh, well, author uh, Joseph Pierce said that the problem with modern readers uh, uh, reading, approaching the, the comedy is that they often get stuck in hell, which is you've all kind of alluded to that right now. Uh, and that they refuse to move on to purgatory and uh, par paradise. Uh, now, Father Paul, in, in the introduction of one of your volumes, uh, you did suggest, in, and uh, uh, Liz, you sort of just said a similar thing, that obviously the Inferno is the most dramatic uh, uh, from a narrative standpoint of the three. Uh, and Father Paul, you said that most people will not likely want to see a miniseries, a TV miniseries of Purgatory and Paradiso. Um, but as you said, those later two books, particularly Purgatory, really does offer the most practical part of the journey. Um, and does the fascination with Inferno uh, really say something about our culture today? Well, I think it does in some sense because it sensationalizes and, and sort of glorifies um, the sins that people commit without really looking at Seems like we might have lost. Because I don't yeah. do that sort of thing. Whereas Purgatory, Purgatory won't let you off the hook. You're reading things and thinking, oh, well, that's me all over, isn't it? Um, and so Purgatory is the book for the people who have already made a sort of commitment to living a better life. And once you've made that commitment, there is a lot of work to be done. And Purgatory is giving us sort of inkling of how much purgation is actually necessary. Purgation is supposed to begin right now. Um, and it's not about just making things right with God. It's about making things right within ourselves, that we become our own worst enemies. And I think people aren't re as ready to receive that truth because it places the... May have... I think Father Paul just uh, froze up there for a second. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess, like Mother Teresa had once said that the whole road to heaven is heaven. Well, the whole road to purgatory, or at least you could start your road to purgatory uh, in, in trying to redirect your life uh, in, in the right way. Um, does anybody want to add anything before we uh, move on? Randy? One observation, um, two cheers for the here and now. I mean, even with what, what Liz was saying earlier about representations of the Divine Comedy, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect the, the interest in Inferno isn't only some manifestation of, of modern disorder. Mm -hmm. I suspect there has been historically a greater interest in Inferno because of the dynamism and, and kind of easily accessible drama of that part of the canticle in a way that it is much harder to kind of get your head around with respect to Purgatory and Paradiso. So I think historically, again, I'm just mm -hmm. speculating, historically I suspect Inferno has probably always been more popular. It's also the start, frankly, right? And, you know, and it's pretty intense. And then kind of you can, you can imagine people kind of getting to a certain point and thinking, okay, that was great. Wow, look at that, look at that giant frozen devil eating three people. How is he going to top that? And they might just end right there. I, I also think... I think you're right. It's the fact that the story is so compelling that he takes you by the hand and he brings you into this horrible place where the depictions are so incredibly powerful. And then the language also, a lot of the language he uses, particularly in the Inferno, is very... It's a rough 
common everyday language. So you're reading this incredibly important poem. And remember that the terza rima, the, the rhyming system that he develops, it has a real momentum. Like you can't get off that, you can't get off that, 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 that roller coaster. So mix the, the momentum, this very rough language at times, some of the some of the souls he encounters in the inferno speak like people on the street. It's kind of that way that a really good screenwriter might suddenly use a, a way of having a character express himself that it's like, whoa, you, you sound like somebody I know. And so these figures become very familiar and they become, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes very tabloidy at times. So it's really, really easy to read. And it's very, very, very easy for people to imagine in their minds. So it's very easy for them as they're reading the story to imagine themselves in the place. As you begin the ascent towards purgatory, yes, we can still, especially towards the beginning, we follow, we follow fairly well. And the stories are still very dynamic and the stories are very interesting. But as you move further and further up, Dante starts talking less about these individual events and, and histories. It becomes less about the people pages and a little bit more he's moving towards philosophy and the overwhelming questions of how do you end up here? What does it mean to, to, to move forward in your faith? How far can faith take you? How far can reason take you? How does faith take over? So that by the time people may make it through the purgatory and then the paradise becomes difficult because you're no longer sitting, your feet no longer um, uh, are able to rest on these stones of, you know, stories of people and stories of places because now we are, as indeed Dante and Beatrice are, uh, are ascending, you're moving into the, in a world, world of pure ideas. So I, I don't think it's so much, um, uh, uh, a, a desperate situation of the human existence right now. I think it's just it, it's harder to read these things because most people don't spend that much time in their heads. Yeah, uh, and and I also I think it speaks to the the banality of evil. Uh, you know, evil is easy to understand because we kind of experience. But even Dante himself says, as they go up the Mount of Purgatory, and certainly as they ascend into Paradise you're starting to deal with concepts that words kind of just fail at. And, and he says that over and over again, that he's going to try his best, but even the highest poetry is going to fall short of what he's experiencing that. So um, I think in hell, it's easy because we see ourselves much easier than that. In, in hell, it's not so much what happens to these people as they're revealed for who they really are. Um, now, um, just to sort of tie one bow around that idea of the Inferno, you know, most people, when they think of the trilogy, as, as we've said many times, it's the Inferno that comes to mind. Um, and because of that, I think the those unfamiliar with Dante, I, I guess the general perception is that he was a grim author and it's, it's, a, uh, it's all about, you know, a doom and gloom and judgment and this eternal torture and punishment. Uh, you know, obviously the famous line about abandoning hope. Um, but really two thirds of this poem is about nothing but grace and hope and mercy. Um, and it, it's really, uh, particularly purgatory is, is a catalog of divine mercy. Um, you know, one of the, the moments that really struck me the most was uh, the, the story of uh, Buoncante who, you know, has this life of a sinner and right as his, you know, he has this final, a little bit of a spoiler here, but he has this, you know, final act of repentance. Um, and right as his soul is about to be whisked away by a demon, an angel comes to rescue him. And, and the, the, the demon is really upset. And he says, you're going to take this soul from me for one tear. Uh, and it's such a beautiful. Like he wants a video song. replay or something, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So could you talk a little bit about maybe this unfair misperception uh, that, that Dante is, is about uh, doom and, and uh, judgment, uh, when, as, as Pope Francis said, you know, he really is a, a prophet of hope. Can I, can I maybe um, just speak directly to that? Um, he's a prophet of hope in all these kind of major ways uh, that I think you were just describing that. I think Liz was just sort of mentioning, especially when it comes to some of the ideas, some of the theology at work, uh, especially in Paradiso. But what I delight in 
in Dante would be those smaller moments of hopefulness. Uh, my favorite character in the entire Divine Comedy is Balakwa, uh, an, a very minor character among some 500, who Dante encounters, but not mistaken, in the fifth canto of Purgatory. Maybe it's the sixth. And um, Dante remembers him as a musician. He was a minor musician in Florence in the 1290s who had died. And Dante is really surprised to see him in Purgatory, you know, with, with the obvious implication about where he might have expected to see him. Um, but he finds Balacqua just sitting under the shade of a rock while all of the other um, denizens of Purgatory are already ascending the mountain. Dante observes that Balacqua was famously lazy in life. And in the afterlife, he's still lazy. Dante says to him, you know, aren't, aren't you going to go? And he says, yeah, I'll go at some point, sure. And there's there's a deep delight in that um, with, a, with a point as well about the continuity of our personhood in this life and the next, right? Instead of some simplistic understanding of a complete and total change from this life to the next. And you're not, mm -hmm. you're not you anymore. You're someone else because you've been saved. What, a, what an impoverished sense of what it means to be a distinctive human person. Um, but to see hope, even in this minor way, mm -hmm. is to just see how much uh, hope is in the Divine Comedy more, more generally. I think that, that that idea of hope, hope doesn't really work if hope is just a sort of general thing. Hope has to be a hope, not just God could save somebody, but that God could save this mess that's me. And what we see in, 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 in the Divine Comedy, especially in Purgatorio, but to some extent in Paradiso too, are these really surprising stories, these moments where people are snatched from the fire at the last minute, or people who you think, these aren't really the people I think of as saints, people who left the convent and did this or did that, who were sort of failures in some sense. But if God can't save the failures, then most of us don't have much of a chance. So the idea that somehow God reaches down into this particularity and saves ordinary sort of people, and it also, as Randy was saying, it's often those ordinary people who are the most moving ones because they say, yeah, if, well, God got him, he could probably get me too. And hope has to be that particularity. It has to be, be this ability to look at the plan of salvation and see myself as a character in it. It can't just be an abstraction. And not only the ordinary people, but it's this view of trying to redeem a history. I mean, it, Dante does such a beautiful job looking back into even the pagan world and saying, yeah. you know, salvation history has to be open to everyone. Um, and rather than, you know, in our culture that, uh, you know, we're, we're in this moment now with trying to, in, in, in some regards, you know, cancel parts of history, Dante's work is about trying to redeem history and even work in these, these famous pagan personalities that, as, as you said, Father, you wouldn't think would, you know, would be on that short list of, of the pearly gates. And who's who's Riffius after all? You know, unless unless you're a specialist in the Persian Wars, you have no idea who Riffius is. And and I only knew him even after doing classics from reading the Divine Comedy. And there he is with the just rulers. Um, Liz, you know, as you said, uh, apart from its literary uh, impact over the centuries. Uh, probably uh, very few works have had as much impact on the visual arts as well. Um, you know, artists have been fascinated with Dante probably since the beginning. Uh, you think of the, the sketches of Garay and, and even Salvatore Dali. Uh, but in, in uh, researching for this conversation, I, I learned something. I didn't realize that uh, Rodin's famous thinker was actually inspired by Dante as well. Could you talk a little bit about how Dante has inspired and influenced uh, the great visual artists. Well, Dante's thinker, as, as the, yes, Dante has been a tremendously influential for a great many artists. Um, the Renaissance was a little bit more, despite all of the frenetic art artistic activity, um, the Renaissance tended to look at the Divine Comedy as a, a manuscript to be illustrated. So it, most of their illustrations, including the famous Botticelli, 
uh, illustrations, but there was also a, a, a man named Johnny Piero, who was also a uh, illustrator. There are actually several illustrators of the Divine Comedy. They tend to look at it more as if it were a, sort of a manuscript illustration, uh, even with sort of the bright colors, uh, the way you expect an illumination. Things get very interesting as the Divine Comedy moves out of the Italian peninsula and into the rest of Europe. And in particular, uh, people like Gustave Doré will be part of this project to bring the Divine Comedy into France. And so we're already in the 19th century. But these, these incredible, this was really a, a, something that was very, very important to Doré to the point that when he went to the publisher originally, the publisher said, no, I'm not doing this. And he offered to do the first series on his own, the, uh, the publisher, who I think was Ashad, uh, then called him up and said, first, first edition, tremendously successful, I've been an ass, come back. And so that's that's the uh, origin of the amazingly beautiful Doré. I mean, in my opinion, Doré does the most beautiful uh, illustrations. Mm -hmm. However, William Blake, who was tremendously Christian spiritual man, had done, of course, a lot of this kind of spiritual literature. He found himself for three years working the uh, illustrations, working on watercolor illustrations of the Divine Comedy. And so then those get very interesting because of their more kind of abstracted way of designing things. He has these big sort of soft colors. Things are very bulbous and amorphous. It's a very interesting way that he uses his art in order to draw out the ideas and the themes of uh, Dante's story. And then my, my personal favorite is actually, believe it or not, Salvador Dali who um, began the project of uh, working on the Divine Comedy as a series of illustrations uh, at request of the Italian government in 1940, I don't remember the year exactly. And he was, it, he was officially invited to work on this project while he was living in Italy. And during that period, he was undergoing a really very powerful conversion. And so this is the period where he meets Pius XII, he starts working on the Madonna of Ligat, and he gets handed this commission to engage with the Divine Comedy, which clearly really sparked his imagination. And what I find is the most beautiful thing about Dali's illustrations is that you would expect the man who did the persistence of memory and the melting clocks and this Freudian surrealism stuff to be stuck on the inferno. But the place where he really excels one of the very few artists who succeeds in doing this is the Paradiso, because he thinks he's thinking in terms of atomic. So he's taking things apart and he's, they're very abstracted and yet they have form. They're luminous and yet they're yet they're concentrated. And it makes incredible illustrations for the for the Paradiso. Yeah, some of those images um, by Dali are, are, are just fascinating. Um, you know, I mean, I guess the other great poets, whether it's Homer or Virgil, uh, certainly Shakespeare, uh, you know, it, it's hard to label greatest. But one of the things that I uh, was so struck by in, in reading Dante is that it is that marriage of both faith and reason. And obviously, reason uh, in the person of Virgil cannot get him all the way up to paradise, but it gets him pretty far up the mountain. Um, and I think that is something that is often misunderstood um, about faith in general and certainly about the church. Uh, they try to, uh, you know, somehow pit faith against reason. And I think Dante does such a beautiful job of showing uh, that line from. Uh, Pope John Paul II's, uh, you know, uh, uh, encyclical, Faith and Reason, that faith and reason are both wings that the spirit rises in contemplation of the truth. Um, and I think that line is so beautifully woven throughout the entire comedy. Could you speak a little bit about the importance of reason uh, in that journey? Sure. The, um, I think that the, the idea that reason is something separate from faith is, is, first of all, it's not very theologically sound because we believe that everything supernatural is something natural lifted up. And in fact, faith is my reason elevated. What I use with my seminarians, I right, say, how high do you have to lift a, a, a man to, to see over a 10 foot wall if the man is blind? 
Well, it doesn't really matter how high you lift him because he's not going to see anything anyway. If I lift reason up and reason is in the end blind, then faith is going to be blind too. This is why the church has always found itself, especially at the First Vatican Council back in 69, 1869, 1870, defending the power of reason. Because without the power of reason, faith becomes powerless too. And then we see in, in Dante, we see the power of reason to attain even to salvation with Riffius and Trajan. We see the possibility of people following their reason in good faith and being saved even outside of the sacraments of the church or outside of the context of revelation. Virgil is a very interesting case because I, I, Virgil isn't quite pure reason. He's also a very individual character, which is one of the things Dante does. He never gives us sort of cardboard cutout characters. The people are always three-dimensional real people. Virgil has his own issues. He's not just, a, not just pure reason. He's somebody who has been given a great gift and hasn't lived to that gift fully. We see that particularly in his conversation with Statius. When Statius says, you're the inspiration for me becoming a Christian. You're the reason I'm here in purgatory. And Virgil says, oh my goodness, well, you got here, maybe I should have gotten here too. Over the course of Inferno and Purgatorio, we see how Virgil hasn't used his reason fully. And that even for Virgil, salvation would have been possible if he would have given himself wholeheartedly to the message entrusted to him. Well, the, you know, obviously before um, we get to our final question, um, I want to ask something. The three of you have lived with Dante for a long time. You've read him. You've loved uh, his, his work. Is there a particular moment in the Divine Comedy that, that stays with you? I mean, I, I know, Randy, you had spoken about uh, the musician in Purgatory, but is there... Is there any other moment? Um, I'll give you a minute to think about it. My particular moment in rereading it uh, in preparation for this conversation was the moment uh, as they're ascending the mountain purgatory where Dante thinks he's experiencing an earthquake. Uh, and it's really one soul finally making his or her way up the paradise. And the entire community of purgatory is so happy for that soul that it rejoices for that other uh, person. Uh, and the joy is so great that it, it shakes the entire mountain. And that idea of real joy being joy for another, uh, I think is such a beautiful thought and it's so beautifully expressed in that episode. Um, how, about, how about you all? I, I'll just go quickly. Um, I mentioned the law court earlier, but even just with, with what Father Paul said, you know, one of the one of the gifts of making the decision to read Dante for the rest of your life is that um, different features or moments of the poem come back to you afresh. And so, what what comes to me just from from what Father Paul was just saying was the initial encounter in Purgatory between Statius and Virgil where you see one facet of Virgil's character that otherwise wouldn't be there, which is uh, modesty. He doesn't want, you know, Statius is very, uh, is, is, is kind of going on at length about the grandeur of Virgil. And there's a kind of, a, there's some smiling that happens. And then Virgil doesn't want Dante to reveal who he is. Uh, because in some ways it would almost be embarrassing. It would be too much. Um, you know, and then that, so, so that moment gives you a sense of humanness that otherwise might not be there. And then the other would be, you know, whenever you see these moments, I think it happens with Virgil and Statius, of the kind of failed embrace. These are shades. And because they are shades, when they are, you know, even though they are thinking, believing, knowing persons, when they want to be embodied, uh, there's still that limit, right? They can't. And so there's something poignant about that. And then there's something wonderfully comic about uh, Virgil's modesty when Statius first meets him. Uh, Liz? Um, so I, the one that is the most poignant for me, the one that I remember um, just incredibly vividly, it's probably because of the way that we read it back at the University of Bologna. It's in the Inferno. It's the uh, when he takes his first steps with Virgil and um, they, they encounter, you know, they're stepping into hell and you're thinking, oh, the wailing and the screaming is going to start. But the very first thing they encounter are sighs. And just the sound of the sad longing and sighing, and he 
looks at Vir Virgil, who's, who's gone pale, and thinks, oh my goodness, the horrors are going to wait. But instead, he describes outside purgatory the sadness of the people who have not known God, not baptized. And Dante and, and Virgil reveals already in the very opening scene his own vulnerability and that he'll accompany this journey, but he will never be able to go the full way because he has never known the Lord. He's never been given the sacrament. I think it was one of the most compelling arguments for a sacrament, not 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 finger wagging, not threatening, just uh, just the sense of what loss really feels like. I think it's the most perfect opening into the into the inferno, because it's much more powerful in many ways than all the punishments combined. The idea of the thing that you just don't you don't have, and yet you wish you had it. Uh, I'd like to take. I'd like to go up to per, to Paradiso for this. There, there are two moments when Dante's asked to look back at Earth by Beatrice. And the first time he does it, he looks back and he immediately locates Florence. And he sees everything in, in the perspective of him having come so far from Florence. And it's almost as though he's looking back and seeing where he's come from. And now he's ready to move on. The next time he looks back, he looks back so that he can take his leave. And this freedom from the things of this world and as he turns to heaven with joy that moment of freedoms is it's almost overwhelming the other thing that i, I like in, in the paradiso dante is talking about whether there's anything to look forward to in paradise and one of the souls says he's looking forward to the resurrection of the body because he'll be able to embrace his friends and relatives again and that idea that somehow the souls in heaven are actually looking forward to the resurrection of the body made the resurrection of the body seem like something far more than just an event that went with the last judgment. Uh, that there was this real longing for it in heaven. And th those are both very moving for me. Yeah, and that um, that there will be, it's, it's the, the afterlife is not a diminution. It's ultimately will be, um, uh, it will be something greater, fuller, deeper. Um, I think that, and, and to going back to what Liz said about hell, I, I, I also love the scene where they're at that little moment of terror when they are at the uh, the gates of that fortress uh, in in the second ring, and uh, even Virgil's not sure how to get out of that predicament, and uh, they're assisted by an angel. But when the angel comes, it's it's not even an effort. It's almost like he just brushes open the the gates. You know, hell has. It's, it's stronghold and it's, it's nothing. And it reminded me of the line from uh, Tolkien, who was also a, a great admirer of Dante, where when his two hobbits are, are at their darkest moment, they look up and they see a single star. And, they, and Sam, Sam Gamgee realizes that in the end, darkness and evil is just a small thing. Um, and uh, that, that line came back to me at that moment, but there's so many of those moments. Um, okay, so for the final question, I was listening to an interview uh, online uh, a few weeks ago with, with actually a, an exorcist. And he said one of the most chilling things I ever heard. He said, in hell, there is no friendship. Um, and I had just been reading, I'd just been finishing up reading Paradiso, where it shows how, if anything, heaven is this perfect communion, communion with God, but communion with each other. Uh, and just hearing those two things, perfect communion and a place where there is no friendship. Um, Bishop Barron has said that ultimately uh, the uh, Divine Comedy is a celebration of, of seeing. And as our world sort of increasingly becomes divided and our politics become more polarized, what can Dante help us to see uh, that can offer us a way out of this dark wood of division and polarization. Um, you know, obviously coming to this work through a Catholic lens is one thing, but Dante speaks to everything, has someone to say to everyone, Catholic, non-Catholic, religious, non-religious. What can he help us see uh, that, that can uh, bring a little bit more unity and a little bit more communion to the world? Maybe I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, I, in 
I would gladly make the case that the entire Divine Comedy is an elaboration of the one of the opening lines of Augustine's Confessions. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. So I very much agree with you, David, and lament all the divisiveness we see in public life today. But what about our own divisiveness? What about our own sense, our own kind of internal lives, the way that Father Paul earlier was describing, you know, kind of the mess of a human life in some ways. And, you know, if you, if you consider the entirety of the Divine Comedy, there's that sense, especially by Paradiso, of that dividedness falling away, of, of the kind of the difficult work of, uh, of redemption that goes on, let's say, for the middle canto. And then that sense of being, of being and being made whole uh, before, the, before the face of God, knowing and being known by God. Um, we can turn to Dante and read the fullness of Dante to reach that moment, that place, imagine, in imaginative terms at least, and that sense of abiding, of a mutual abiding. And to be able to experience that at any point in anyone's life, anywhere, at any, at any time, I think, is, uh, is a great gift and is the great and continuing gift of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, Liz? I think, the, I think we discover that our journey is something that is a, a, a common shared journey. In many ways, this to me is a lot like the Sistine Chapel. Um, Michelangelo knew the uh, Divine Comedy by heart, according to uh, Giorgio Vasari or Leonardo da Vinci. And, um, and as a matter of fact, that uh, I think that wonderful story of Bon Conte being saved by a tear is actually depicted in The Last Judgment. But... Um, the Sistine Chapel is a, a, a spot where a painter took, created a collective vision. So a collective beginning and ending, where we're coming from and where we're going. And I think the Divine Comedy really draws us into a collective story. So it's also like the Iliad and the, and the it's also like the Odyssey and the Aeneid. But where the Odyssey is the story that you know, tells the Greek guy trying to come home. Um, the Aeneid is the story of the foundation of the Roman people. Dante creates a collective story where we all see ourselves as part of a journey um, to become children of God, to become a collective Christian people. And that draws us together. So when you're in hell, people are stuck in their isolated spots doing their punishments. But the minute we get to purgatory, people are traveling together. They're working together. They're journeying together. As soon as we start passing through the imperiums of the Paradiso, there's a collectiveness and a togetherness. And I think this description, this, this way of speaking about our journey that is in sort of micro and macro, our personal journey is part of a larger journey. This is really, it's a, it's a tremendous gift for us to feel united to our fellow travelers, not only in the time that we are in, but past and present. I think in many ways, Dante's Divine Comedy can be seen as a sort of exercise in, in identity politics. I think for us, we focus on identifying ourselves through divisions and by belonging to this camp or to that camp. Dante has a lovely picture of that in Paradiso in the Circle of the Sun where the theologians are. St. Thomas is right next to Sajur of Brabant who ended up getting Thomas condemned for a while because of his extreme positions. St. Bonaventure is right next to Joachim of Fiore who was the leader of the spiritual branch of the Franciscans who Bonaventure spent most of his career as superior general trying to keep under wraps. These people who might be seen as enemies in history end up being side by side in heaven. And for us then, as, as Liz was saying, our identity has shifted from the political party that we belong to or the intellectual school that we've grown from, but from being commonly children of God. And that common basis is something that our modern world tends to lose sight of so easily. And perhaps it's a function of the world getting bigger. There's a huge sociological question. But one way or another, we have to come back to an identity that arises from our common humanity and our common calling. That's beautiful, beautifully said. And I uh, can't really add anything to that. Um, you know, I guess Dante answers Sartre, who said, hell is other people. Um, Dante would say heaven is other people. Um,
And um, one commentator that I read said that you don't read Dante, Don, or you don't read the comedy, the comedy reads you. And you, uh, y it really is a, a journey that I think everyone should take. Um, uh, well, I could talk about Dante with you for the next 700 years, but we don't have 700 years. Um, we're out of time, um, but Dante uh, always, throughout the comedy, continually expressed his gratitude to his guides, and I can do no less. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lev, Professor Boyagata, and Father Paul. Thank you for your time. Thank you for reminding us that, like Dante, who lived in a very fractious time, and obviously the Italy of his day, there were many parallels to um, our time and place. Uh, but the idea that to build that, that unity and that order collectively, I think we have to start with trying to build that order within our own soul. And the way to do that, as you said, Father Paul, so beautifully, is to try to always work closer to that love that moves the stars. Um, now, before we go, I do want one more time to, um, you know, it is Christmas and uh, people are looking for gift ideas and certainly buying someone the three volumes of Dante would be a wonderful gift idea. But if they already had that, there is uh, Father Paul's three volume uh, spiritual guide to Dante. Uh, the newest, uh, the third and final volume is coming out early uh, next year. Correct, Father Paul? Yes. Uh, there is Dr. Lev's How Catholic Art Saved the Faith. I apologize, uh, Liz, I don't have a cover of your most recent book, which is uh, A History of St. Joseph in Art. And last but not least, Dante's Indiana by uh, Randy Boyagoda, who actually worked on this book here at the Sheen Center and was very kind to give us a little thank you. Um, I love the, uh, the opening line for the, um, the novel, Riding Through the Valley, I Looked Up and Lost My Way. Uh, thank you for the three of you for helping us find our way today. And I also wanna thank our viewers, our audience members. Um, if you have enjoyed today's conversation and conversations like this, um, I encourage you to please consider uh, making a donation to the Sheen Center, uh, if you're able. Uh, until next time, stay safe, be well, God bless.